While on a flight, Dr. Dave Levy turned to his wife, Allison Bataki, and asked if his eye looked strange. It did, and it turned out he was having a stroke at the age of 30. During an extended recovery at the same hospital where he was a surgical resident, Dave struggled with memory retention. It was at this time that Allison began writing letters to him. The letters are now a part of her memoir, Beauty in the Broken Places, a manifesto for living, but ultimately an uplifting story about the transformative power of faith and resilience. Can you tell us a little bit about the stroke that occurred um, and what exactly happened? Yeah, so um, I'm a physician, so I know you know a lot of the medical uh, elements of it. Um, and so what I had is what's called a biothalamic uh, midbrain stroke. Biothalamic uh, means affected both sides of my thalamus, um, uh, which is rare. Usually strokes are on one side of the brain, um, but the thalamus is a very centrally located element of your brain. And so if you have a, a biothalamic stroke, it can um, affect, or if you have a thalamic stroke, it can affect both sides. Um, and what happened was I was on an airplane and um, I went to sleep and, uh, you know, just like any other plane ride, um, I was with my wife and we were going to, uh, we were going from Chicago to Seattle. I have two brothers who live in Seattle and we we're going to visit them. And uh, I, uh, at some point in the ride, just woke up, turned to my wife and I said, you know, does my left eye look weird? And she said, yeah, it does. It looks very weird because it was the pupil was uh, asymmetrically very dilated, um, uh, uh, you know, single so unilateral asymmetrically dilated uh, pupil, um, which from medicine, you know, is sort of an emergency. Um, you, it, a lot of times it's unfortunately associated with fatal things. Um, and, uh, you know, my wife flagged down the, the you know, flight attendants eventually got in touch with the nurse on the plane and they talked with me. And then, you know, we eventually the plane got uh, diverted to Fargo, North or North Dakota, because that was on our flight from Chicago to Seattle. You can imagine there's not a lot else. Um, but of course, we were able to land in Fargo and uh, went to hospital. They did the CT scan, whatever. They diagnosed my, my stroke. Um, but I was unconscious for. Uh, like two or three days, I feel like. Um, so very bad stuff. Basically, uh, as soon as he, I, I've been sleeping because we were on, on a plane to our baby moon. Uh, it was going to be our last flight, our last trip before we had our baby. Mm -hmm. We were both 30 years old. We were both healthy. You know, as he said, he was a physician, lifelong athlete, runner, healthy eater, you know, non-smoker, nothing that you would associate with risks of a stroke. But when he nudged me to ask if his eye looked weird and I noticed how weird it looked, basically within a few minutes after that, he lost consciousness. He, he went from not being able to see anything to then just shutting his eyes and being gone. Mm -hmm. And so that was really scary because we were 35,000 feet up in the air. Nobody had any idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. And initially, you know, we even had these naive hopes that it was something as benign as low blood sugar or just he temporarily lost consciousness because he was not, you know, a high risk individual to have had a stroke. And I think they even thought I had low blood sugar. I think yeah, they tried they to tried give me to, yeah. glucose or sugar. They tried to put the orange juice down his yeah. mouth, but he was unconscious. He was in a coma. So as a result, he aspirated the orange juice. So as a result, he had pneumonia for a few days because he had all this liquid in his lungs. lungs. But anyways, Initially, they ruled out the hemorrhagic stroke because they saw there wasn't bleeding going on in his brain. And while we were in the ER in the ICU and he was still unconscious, they said, you know, the only other stroke that this would be would be ischemic. And we just really think that that's so unlikely for Dave's profile. And also that would be so bad at this point if that had happened that he'd probably already be dead. Mm. And so it was hours later where they came back with the bad news and they said, it's the really bad, really, really serious stroke. 
And at that point they said, you know, we were in Fargo, North Dakota. They said, you should probably inform his family members, his parents, that if they want to say goodbye, they should get on a plane and come, come to Fargo. And that's how bad it was really pretty grim for a few days. And so and I'll, I'll give you a quick uh, medical rundown of what, what happened. Um, so, uh, you know, on an airplane, they always tell you to move your legs, you know, pump your legs because you get blood clots in your legs because your legs are so static and your blood is static. And so then you, you get a blood clot and then that clot can travel up to your uh, heart and to your lungs and typically would cause a pulmonary embolism. Mm -hmm. um, that's what a, a blood clot in your lungs. That's what a pulmonary embolism is. But with me, what I had was the first anatomic abnormality was I had a, a patent foraminal valley, which foraminal valley is something everybody has in their heart. Um, it's a little hole that diverts blood to go the opposite way when you're in your mom's tummy as a baby. And uh, it closes in all people like within 20 minutes of birth or something like that. But like in, I think 20% of people or so, it stays open for life. And it's just, you know, uh, an insignificant thing. Your blood flows normally, but you've got this patent frame of valley. And I think I had a, a pretty big one and they had to close it surgically um, a few months after my stroke. Uh, but that was the first thing. And then the second anatomic abnormality I had was I had in my heart or in my brain, what's called a patent for, or uh, sorry, patent for, uh, it's called the artery of Pergeron, which is uh, an artery going to your thalamus. And it's one artery going to your thalamus. Most people have many arteries going to their thalamus. It's a very important part of your brain, the thalamus is. Um, and, but I only had one artery going to it, just a big one. But that artery got clogged by the blood clot and caused my stroke. It, it, a very odd circumstance to get that blood clot to go up to my artery of Pergeron because, uh, you know, it has to go not down, back down to your legs, which is the most common place for a blood clot to go after you've had one. Um, it goes up to my neck and then it goes to my head and then it goes to my brain and then it goes to my thalamus. Like all these crazy things happened and it just so happened to, to occur. Um, the, the saving grace sort of for me um, was that it occurred at a relatively young age for me because thalamic strokes are a big deal. Um, but I was able to recover because I was young. And uh, so that was, you know, sort of the, the fortuitous element of it was that it occurred when I was so young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. But still doesn't matter. It's still, yeah. still an awful thing that happened. Course, Fortunately, fully recovered. But, you know, regardless, of course. It sounds, yeah. I mean, I can only picture it in my brain as to what, mm -hmm. like, what it was like and what you went through, Allison. Well, Obviously, you too, Dr. Levy, but still, like, mm -hmm. it's, it's, anyways, I'm glad they were on the other end as much <laughs> as it's, you. as hard as it was. Uh, so what was your biggest challenge, I guess, for both of you, um, ha having just had the stroke, Dr. Levy, and then um, Allison as his wife and, um, you know, the process of caring for him and so forth? Yeah, I mean, uh it, it was it was very difficult initially because my memory was bad. I mean, it, a lot of um, uh, mental abilities were not there. I, I essentially, you know, the, the months of recovery, it probably took, you know, uh, eight, 10 months or something to, to recover. Um, and I, I liken it to growing up. Like it was like I was like a little kid. Yeah. Initially, no, no, less functional than a newborn. Yeah, less functional yeah. than a newborn. Initially. When he woke up, there were certain things he was not capable of doing that newborns wake up, be, you know, are born. Like the first thing a newborn does is breathes on his or her own. And Dave couldn't breathe. And no. a newborn drinks milk and swallows and gets its first nutrition. Dave couldn't swallow. It was it was a huge milestone when Dave passed the swallow test and he could start having liquids as opposed to just intravenous yeah. um, nutrition. He had to basically regrow his brain and learn everything about life from less functional than a newborn. And he was also in a state of complete amnesia for a very long time. So he wasn't making new memories and it was really hard for him to access the long-term memories. I think that for me was the biggest challenge was just sure. one person fell asleep and another person completely, entirely new version of Dave woke up. 
Mm-hmm. And you don't know where you will settle in terms of reconciling the two, what version you will end up with. And that was scary and it was sad and it was really lonely. The other thing that was interesting was in the midst of all this, uh, she was pregnant. Yeah. And we uh, had our first daughter, um, like probably what, like five or so months into my recovery. Yeah. And so like that, I think was probably scary for everybody yeah. to like yeah. me to be holding a baby and taking care of a baby or whatever. <laughs> And, um, I mean, I was fine and I knew it, but I don't think everybody else knew it. Well, and I remember when he was lying in his rehab bed and his rehab physician said, you know, it was June when he had the stroke and the baby was due in October. And the doctor said, I suspect he will be very involved in the birth of your child. And just looking at him at that moment, I was thinking, I was like, okay, thanks doctor. But thinking to myself, there is no way this man does not even know what city we live in. You know, this man cannot even tell me the date. How is he going to, but it really, it was miraculous to watch the brain heal and to watch neuronal plasticity, the ability of the brain to adapt and grow and form new neural pathways to learn, relearn things. And Dave worked his rear end off every day, all day with occupational speech, um, physical therapy, cognitive therapy, just, it was really, really remarkable. A combination of just healing, natural healing, amazing healthcare, um, amazing hard work and effort on his part. And, and that sort of nebulous ability of the brain to adapt and heal to injury um, in a way that sort of defied the expectations because his stroke was so rare that when he survived it, there was literally no case literature on how to rehab a patient of his profile with his age having suffered his stroke. So nobody could tell us what to expect or what to do. We were all kind of making it up as we went. And so that was scary, but it also gave all of his therapists and doctors great hope because we kept moving the goalpost forward and forward as Dave kept hitting these milestones. And there was basically no reason not to hope that he could continue to heal as long as he kept trying and kept working, which he did. And, and they kind of threw the kitchen sink at me um, mm-hmm. in that, you know, when you go through therapy after a stroke, you, you can get three different types of therapy. You get speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy. And usually people get one, maybe two of those things. And I got all three. And I would go five days a week to the therapy sessions, um, which was pretty rare. A lot of people would go, you know, two or three times a week. Um, and that was all because they thought I could get better. Yeah. As, young. as they said, you know, this isn't a 75 year old stroke survivor who wants to rehab to go back to a life of retirement. This is a 30 year old man who's been struck down in the prime of his life and his career and his family. And mm-hmm. they said, you know, we really need to work very, very hard because he wants to get back to a very high level of functionality. And so it was, it was a really, you know, steep uphill battle. Mm-hmm. Of course, That's, for sure. But you made it through, like we. I think I keep saying so, but I, yeah, it, it sounds very tough. Uh, so, how during this whole process uh, did you uh, cope psychologically? Um, I was okay because uh, I had my wife here and our newborn girl. Um, you know, now she's five. Um, but it was just so, uh, lovely having them around. I I think psychologically, I I really was, um, okay. I mean, you you said you were sheltered, right? You were sheltered from a lot of that. You just kind of were on your own at first. Like we didn't really, we just kind of closed our circle and we're just kind of in just just with family. Like really the only people we were with were his parents Yeah, to just kind of help him. Cause like he said, he was growing from a newborn. So Really that, yeah, at that point, we lived in, in Chicago yeah. and uh, my parents lived in the Chicagoland area. And so we would stay with them a lot. And uh, yeah, I, w- I was pretty uh, sheltered. I think that um, had I had too much, too many people around, it might have been a little bit overwhelming, mm-hmm. um, but it wasn't uh, uh, that uh, scary. One thing that was uh, interesting that I uh, should shed light on was um, there was uh, the recovery process was very interesting. Um, and one thing was that I, I slept a ton. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I was a resident in orthopedic surgery at the time. And there you're lucky if you get five hours of sleep a night. And I mean, that, that's a lucky night. And I would sleep an insane amount when I come home. I would sleep, you know, like over 24 hours or something yeah, like sometimes. He was it, very it, fatigued. It, it was crazy. But uh, one day I actually felt the recovery um, in the sense that I was awake. It was the middle of the day. I think it was a Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, this was probably about four months or so after mm -hmm. my injury, um, before our, our daughter had been born. And I was reading a paper mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the words became jumbled to me. I couldn't read the paper. I couldn't read the words. I was like, what is going on? Um, and I, I could process that that was weird and everything. And what I did was probably like a little bit more of my medical background was I was thinking like, this is likely transient, temporary, not going to last forever. Um, so why don't I take a nap and try to get better? And that was what I did. I went to sleep. I took a nap and then I woke up and everything was fine. It got back to normal. But I know that a lot of other people, if they had experienced that, would have been freaking out because it was very scary. But what I knew at the time um, was that that was probably my brain healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I could feel it healing. And so that was very encouraging to me. And even though that was a scary event, I almost wanted that to happen mm -hmm. again. It didn't, but yeah. I almost wanted it to. We, uh, we called that almost like he, he had a period of growing pains before he took yeah. a step forward. It wasn't, yeah, exactly. it it's wasn't like, like a linear recovery. It would be like he'd have a few off days and then he'd take a step forward. And what was so interesting was that um, at first he had no ability to make memories. So we would have to talk every single day about, you know, this stroke happened, you're in the hospital, you're going to go to this rehab. And we just had to constantly refresh that. Then he started to remember what had happened and why he was where he was. But I don't think fully processed the gravity like, oh, I'm not at residency right now. I'm not at work. I'm in a hospital as a patient. He just kind of was like almost like the childish innocence of where his brain was like, OK, I'm going to do what they tell me to do. and kind of went along with it. And it was almost like the better he got in terms of cognitive capability, the more we talked about what happened, the more it sunk in, he understood, the harder it became for him in terms of his mental health and his psychology, because then the gravity would really sink in. And I don't think it was, it was months before we had probably for like the 20th time, but for him, the first time, a really serious conversation about what happened where he asked a lot of questions and he was really processing and he wept and I wept. And I, and I remember thinking like, he's far enough along in his recovery now that he can start to understand the gravity of this. And this is when it actually starts to get hard. And, and it was interesting because while he was severely, severely sick in the coma, a bunch of people had written him letters and emails and prayers and notes and cards and he had read those sort of as inspiration in, in the hospital, but he, it didn't soak in. And then he read them again, seven, eight months later. And it was like, he was reading it all for the first time. And that mm -hmm. was when he was really processing people's emotions and love and support and just the gravity of what he and we had lived through. Mm -hmm. and so it was kind of an ongoing an ongoing journey for both of us. Yeah, totally. Sure. Uh, now we're talking about anecdotes. Um, yeah. So, uh, one of or one of the best anecdotes um, is that laughter is the best medicine. Uh, were there any anecdotes that? Um, I guess more of you, Allison, than anything, um, kind of like that kind of came up during um, Dave's recovery and uh, yeah. and when he had a stroke. Yeah. Well, when he was in what we call the toddler phase, which was like, you know, a couple months out where he had progressed enough, he looked outwardly healthy. His was not a stroke that had a ton of physical mm -hmm. deficits as a result. He right. could walk pretty quickly. He could even run on the treadmill. He could do stairs. He could do balance. Mm -hmm. So I think that was confusing for people because he looked a lot better than functionally he actually was. <laughs> right. 
And so we'd take him out on walks to get out of the hospital. And at this point it was summer and we tried to get him fresh air and it was just very stimulating to be outside. We'd go to Lake Michigan, particularly on his breaks from rehab. And it was one day where it was 4th of July mm-hmm. and that's a big deal in Chicago and everyone was out at the beach and people were probably, you know, at various levels of sobriety. And <laughs> so I'm walking with this big 200 pound man who physically is able to walk, but cognitively is, is basically like a toddler. And he had no inhibitions for a while. Like he almost seemed like like he had no judgment, no good judgment. So we were walking towards the beach and he, he sees this cop and he's like, I want to yell at that cop. I want to yell at that cop. I was like, you cannot yell at that cop. It's 4th of July. He's going to think you're drunk in public. You're going to get arrested. How am I going to explain? I'm like severely pregnant. I'm like trying to help him make good decisions. But there, there were moments like that where in, in the present, they were scary for me and hard and a little bit sad. But after the fact, we kind of just laughed at the fact that he really did go through this toddler phase where he was like a petulant little child. They're like, we'd go out to brunch and he'd be putting his food all over the place. And, but he was like this man that but, looked but good. Just interesting that I would ask, yeah, like, he knew. I want to go yell at that cop. Like, can I go yell at that cop? <laughs> and like, yeah. But we really did know the importance of mental health and keeping his spirits up. And so we really did try to surround him, um, you know, to the extent that he could handle it with his fatigue and with his therapy and with his schedule. But particularly when he was on the inpatient and he was living in the hospital for months, which gets, you know, very sad and lonely. We tried to have visitors. His brothers were amazing. You know, those brothers who didn't live nearby flew in to be with him. His parents were there. My parents were there. We had college friends. We had high school friends. We had teammates. You had med school friends. You had residency friends. We really did try to keep it upbeat in front of him and, and to keep like a kind of an optimistic tone in his room and, decorating it with pictures and memories and movable picture frames. And, um, you know, somebody said something to me, which I think was really true. You need your four pillars when you're going through a crisis. And those are faith, family, friends, and fun. Mm -hmm. And that was absolutely the case. And I think to your point, the laughter falls in with the fun and the friends and the family and the faith aspects of it. But but I agree with you that that's important. Even, Mm -hmm. Even in the darkest moments, there is the potential for for gallows humor and you need it yeah, for sure. Uh, so as we spoke about, uh, a brain injury is, an inv- is invisible, yeah. um, physically, I mean, not, it wasn't in your case, it's been in my case, but you can look different and act different and so yeah. forth, but, um, it is invisible. Um, how, how did you confront, um, others, um, when they looked at you, Dave, and said, oh, you don't, you look totally fine. How do you have an injury? You may act a little differently, you know, when this first happened, um, mm-hmm. but you're fine. Like, how did you confront that? Cause it's very hard for somebody who's not in your shoes or our shoes. Yeah. About. I mean, it, it is a little bit different because I was, I was getting better and I knew that that was one of the hardest things was to see that I'm getting better and maybe more, more better than other people maybe around me, which was tough. That was very tough. Um, but, uh, I mean, you just, I, I think that was where I kind of changed my personality a little bit. I think I was very, um, type a before the stroke and, you know, um, as a hard charging, uh, orthopedic surgery resident, you know, very intense, but then like I, I became more relaxed and that was kind of a way that I responded was I was just more relaxed. I, I trusted that, you know, this interaction with such and such might not go well, but the next one will go fine. And like, like I, I just, I wouldn't continue a conflict if there became a conflict or something. I mean, like, or if somebody asked, you know, um, you know, how you doing or you, you, you look weird or whatever, I'd be like, okay, like, I, you think I look weird? <laughs> Okay. And like, move on. Like, 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 like that's a person who like, I, I'm not going to invest too much time and effort in convincing that person that I'm okay. And, um, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll tell them I am, but I'm not going to, you know, get frustrated over it or something. Right. And, um, yeah. But the invisible aspect of it is hard because yeah. like even maybe nine months after the stroke, 
people who we were kind of casually friends with who hadn't seen, we hadn't seen them anyway. They'd be right. like, Oh, it's so great to see you back to yourself. And then the people who right. really knew Dave and really knew us knew we were still struggling and knew we were still mm-hmm. very much in the thick of it. Right. And, you know, someone breaks a bone, you see their healing, you see their recovering. Yeah. But this with an invisible injury where it's, your personality or your memory or your just, you know, something that's very ethereal and hard to understand. I think it can make people uncomfortable and, or just they don't really know what to say or how to handle it. Um, and that, that, that's yeah. why I think that the, the stroke communities yeah. are, are very, very, very important. Yeah. I mean, because there are people understand what you're going through more. I mean, they, they don't even completely understand it because nobody understands everybody's it, but different, yeah. everybody's different, but um, it, it's a lot more encouraging to be surrounded. By that. And, and I didn't have that really um, in Chicago, at least uh, once we moved out here, there was a, a, a community where I, I, you know, knew some more people, but um, even in the hospital and all this stuff, I, I didn't really have anybody to to confide in because everybody was a hospital employee that I knew right. just like walk into the stroke ward and start talking to people. Yeah. Um, and his stroke didn't really line up. Like he could go to stroke support groups, but it he was always the youngest and he always had a completely yeah. different stroke. Yeah. And even the young people who had strokes, a lot of them had the hemorrhagic and he had this ischemic and or, or some kind of traumatic event yeah. or a car accident or something like that. So yeah. it was hard. It's very isolating. Yeah. And, and I only even just know that as, as his wife and caregiver, but right. you, know, you, you and, and I think that's why to his point, communities like this and, and we did find support from other survivors and other caregivers. I think that was a really, really sustaining um, force that we leaned on. And, 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 you know, being surrounded by the right people, you know, my mm-hmm. wife was terrific. My family was terrific. Having a daughter was very exciting, but like, you know, I mean, people uh, were very supportive around me um, mm-hmm. and that was important. And, uh, you, you know, I think that anybody who's been through that wants that, of course, they want to be surrounded by great people, but, you know, you also can't be a jerk to them or something like that. You know, you can't uh, get, super upset with them or something. A lot of times you just got to kind of let things go. They don't get it. You know, mm-hmm. it's just like, you know, you have a right-handed person, a left-handed person. I had a stroke. They didn't have a stroke. Mm-hmm. They don't get it. And, um, you know, uh, that was just something I got used to mm-hmm. and, um, you know, rolled with it. Yeah, of course. So your daughter is five, correct? You yeah. That. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have another one and now you have another one on the way. So it's like, <laughs> what, what is your, what are your parents going to do with now three grandkids of yours of, from you? I mean, it's going to be, well, so he's the youngest of six boys yeah. and, and he's, wow. he, he was supposed to be the girl. Yeah. And so I just, I tell my mother-in-law, like, you know, it was a long time term investment. Like you got three girls out of the deal. Yeah, eventually, yeah. So yeah, yeah. everyone's happy. It's an, it's another girl. <laughs> That's no. so exciting. Congrats. Yeah. Uh, so just um, talking about your daughter, I know she's five, so she's still very young, but does she have any recollect re- recollection of what, had happened in terms of like her, like, you know, you being a father from what is it? I'm just going to say from when she was born to like three or four, or does she, um, or does it just kind of bypass? I mean, she was very little. So as far as I know, no. Yeah. In real, in real time. No, in real time. No, because the very, very severe difficult months were when she was so little. Right. It's so interesting because I'm seeing, this newborn brain develop and hit milestones and go through this cognitive process right at the same time. I'm seeing my husband's brain (laughs) develop and go through this cognitive process. And it was, it was fascinating. And honestly, I think it made me, it made it easier for me to understand each of them because I, I was learning about brain and neural development and attachment and milestones. uh, And both of them kind of were related to one another. And I think in a lot of ways, having the baby was such a blessing when it happened, because even though it was very stressful and hard and it was a lot of caregiving consolidated in one moment, um, she was just a source of joy and light 
And, uh, and talk about like, you know, when we got him out of the hospital, we had to do all this ADL, you know, activities of daily living. He had to learn how to do, and there's no better therapy and like multitasking than being like, okay, I got to change her diaper. I've got to keep her safe on the changing pad. I've got to yeah. throw the diaper out. I've yeah. got to get her dressed. I've got to bring her, you know, it was like he had a built in OT um, with this little source of like love and light that he loved. And so I think she pulled us all forward. And now that she's five, we're starting to talk to her about the fact that, you know, daddy had this really bad injury when you were in mommy's tummy and, you know, she'll see us on, like, she'll see stroke, stroke smart magazine and we're on the cover and she'll say, you know, why are you on the cover of this magazine? And we'll say, you know, we talked about this experience where daddy was really sick before you were born. Um, and she knows she, she went on the whole, you know, book tour with us when we wrote the memoir about Dave's experience. And we're going to get into that. So she knows in her five-year-old way, uh, yeah. but I'm sure it'll be an ongoing conversation over the course of her life. And just, we, you know, have wept with tears of joy over the fact that he's here to know her because it very, of very, they didn't go that way. Yeah. She, she and might've been born without she, a dad. She would have been, been born tough. without a dad. And then none of our other daughters would have been born. So. And, and, and the other thing about uh, Lily, our oldest girl um, is She's uh, very calm. Mm -hmm. You know, we call her chill Lil. Mm -hmm. um, she's just a very calm girl. And like part of us sort of thinks that like maybe the stress of my event yeah. contributed to that. Yeah. That like somehow my uh, stress or, or the stress of my event uh, caused blood flow to be different mm -hmm. in her body when uh, Lily was born. And so we know we don't know. I mean, there's no yeah. science to back that up or anything, but um we just were like remarkable. we were so grateful because we had this newborn who was like so calm and peaceful and lovely and and had she been yeah. you know like a lot of newborns can be i think i would have lost it but i had this zen little baby oh. that it was like god knew i couldn't handle anything more Super like he was zen. like okay you will have this easy baby and and this is my gift to you after everything <laughs> you've been through yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we're grateful for that <laughs> So you, Allison, you wrote a book called Beauty yeah. and the Broken, um, Beauty and the Broken Pieces, uh, which I've read and read it from front to back. Now, let me tell you, I read a lot. This is a side note. I read a lot of books from everyone that I um, yeah. that I interview. Some of them I just can't finish reading. Yeah. Yours. Oh, my goodness. Read from <laughs> front to back. Like, absolutely amazing. I put it down. Um, yeah, the way you wrote it was just remarkable. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a wonderful book. Uh, but so Beauty and the Broken Pieces is a compelling novel um, about your journey um, with what happened to Dave and yeah. you know, you know, your journey to his recovery. Uh, uh, for those that are watching, can you tell us a little bit more about um, the novel and what your uh, yeah. inspiration um, yeah. and goal was for writing it? Yes. Well, thank you. Um, so I was a writer when Dave had his stroke and I wrote fiction and I wrote adult historical fiction and I loved it. And that was my joy. And this was never anything I expected I would be writing. It was never anything I wanted to write, obviously. Um but it started out basically as just something between us and our family where the first night he had the stroke, June 9th, 2015, I didn't know if he would wake up. I didn't know if he was dying right in front of me. I was suddenly in this ER in Fargo by myself, feeling my baby go crazy inside me from all of the stress and the adrenaline. And I didn't have any idea how to process or cope with what was going on in that immediate crisis. And I opened up my laptop and I started writing and I started, I just wrote a letter to Dave, not knowing if I would ever be able to talk to him again. Right. And over the course of every day, that whole first year of Dave's recovery and struggle, I knew he wasn't making new memories. I knew that we were going through this incredibly intense period in our lives. I hoped that someday he would have the wherewithal to ask questions and, and wonder what he had been through and what we had been through. And so every day I would just write him a letter because um, I knew I couldn't count on myself to remember it all. And I knew he wasn't going to be able to remember it all. And so, you know, in those first days, he'd go to bed really early when he, once he was awake because he had his newborn brain. And so he'd be in bed by like seven o'clock and I'd be sitting in his room 
And I'd be writing him about what we went through that day. You know, today you walked on a treadmill for the first time, or today you swallowed for the first time. All these milestones where it was really helpful to have them down on paper to look back and see, oh, this is how far we've come. And then concurrently with that, we were getting flooded with all of this letter writing that we, you know, we touched on a little bit earlier where his coach was writing to share his favorite memories of Dave. Mm -hmm. kids that Dave hadn't spoken to in 20 years were writing with memories from elementary school when a time when Dave inspired them. Mm -hmm. Family members were sharing things, prayers, cards. And I was just like, gosh, this is like, if Dave wakes up and survives this, he's going to have the chance to basically read a thousand eulogies that would have been given at his funeral. And then he's, he might even have the opportunity to go forward with life and live knowing what all these people feel and knowing what they've all said to him. And I said, this is really powerful stuff. So we put it all together in a book and we called it Dave's book of fan mail. And then I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we still have it. It's one of our most cherished things and we'll share it with our daughters. But then one year after his stroke, June 9th, 2016, I, I basically said, this is the last time I'm going to write in this word document. It was called Dear Dave, because that was how the first letter started on June 9th in the ICU. And that was how I saved it. I said, this is the last page I'm going to write in this. And then after this, we close this and we start a new chapter and we move forward from this. And it was, it was really like how I had processed and journaled almost mm -hmm. um, for myself without having anybody to talk to who could really understand it. And so then... A year after his stroke, we celebrated what we called Dave's Alive Day, which was you know, mm -hmm. June 9th, 2016. It was a really hard, emotional day, remembering what we had been through. And I was going through my clock and remembering every moment from that time a year earlier. And we just, we got together with some friends and some family and we tried to celebrate it and tried to celebrate the fact that you know, he was alive and that we were where we were and that we had our daughter and that, um, that, that we could celebrate life. And at that time, we wrote together a piece for the New York Times just about um, where we had been and what we'd been through. And so then it was around that time that my agent and my editor approached us very sensitively and very delicately. But they were like, <clears throat> would you ever consider writing about this in a more public way? Mm -hmm. um, and my first reaction was, no, I, I don't want to, you know, it's too painful. I don't want to be like living in this more and writing is my joy. It's my happy space. I write fiction, but having written that article and having connected with the people who read the article and having seen how cathartic and necessary it had been for me to write my way through the year we'd been through, mm -hmm. um, I began to sort of think again and think, this is something we could do together that could potentially be really um, hopefully not only beneficial and healing maybe for others, but also for ourselves and just as a way to process. And it was, and, and really where it came down to is, you know, when I was coming home from the hospital, all those nights by myself, not knowing if Dave would make it or ever come home, I could have used something like this. I could have, I could have benefited from reading this and knowing that I was not alone and knowing that other people had walked this road. And so I said, if, if we can do it with that being the purpose to show others that they are not alone, that we've walked this road with them, that, and that there, there is healing, there is hope. Um, and then it's worthwhile. And so it, it, it was obviously an incredibly different process than any other book I've written and a lot more intense and a lot more challenging, but but I would say probably the most worthwhile thing we could have done um, on the other end of the process. And so I'm grateful. I still connect with readers every single day in these really intimate, intense ways because they've read all of this personal stuff about me and from me. And so they share all this intense personal stuff about themselves. And it's just totally different um, as a writer to connect with people in that way and, and really meaningful. And, that, and every single time I get one of those notes, I think it was worth it. Just for that one letter, it was worth it. And, and what's what I think is interesting about it is that, like, um, I, I think that, that it's going to be more applicable to society to have this story be told because uh, more and more young people are going to survive strokes, probably, because it might have been a death sentence before medicine was mm -hmm. as good as it is now. Mm -hmm. And medicine just keeps getting better 
And, you know, we'll probably just keep going up and up with the age of uh, survival. Um, and so uh, I think getting this message out there was very important. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, it was incredibly personal to us, but in a lot of ways, it's incredibly universal because everybody goes through something where they're scared and they're alone and it wasn't what they expected. And life has this sudden upheaval. Um, and that was really what we wanted to get at was that no matter what you're going through in life, no matter where you are, like we can connect on this, on this vulnerability and, and with, you know, having been through this experience, whatever your experience is too. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Um, you have the books amazing and just, yeah, Thank just you. connecting, you're welcome, but just connecting in general is, um, really, really important. Uh, so lastly, you're very involved now, uh, with your book is one, one way, um, but helping others, um, who have dealt with, um, a TBI or a stroke and, um, caregivers in their recovery process. Um, what other work are you, um, doing right now? And like, what words of wisdom or advice would you give to others who are in your shoes? <laughs> So, so we, we came, we're not, now we live in New York, uh, as opposed right. to Chicago, and we came out here originally um, to uh, volunteer at uh, Burke uh, Rehabilitation Center, um, which is a, a hospital that um, in part deals um, with stroke victims. And I would go attend those meetings, uh, talk with people, um, try to help them out, um, and uh you know, we, I did a little bit of work there. Now I, I work uh, for a, a community healthcare organization that helps um, administer healthcare to, to underprivileged or you know, unprivileged uh, people. Um, and uh, that's primarily what I do. I, I, I don't um, practice medicine because I feel that this is more uh, beneficial to society, more helpful to society than just being a doctor and seeing a patient or whatever and treating them. But um, this is a, a larger scale kind of thing. And, um, and you know. yeah. And the main, the main way is, you know, obviously we've, there, there are so many amazing groups out there like yours, American Heart Association, Stroke Smart, uh, uh, Stand Up for Heroes. There are so many. Um, and we, we've had interactions and supports and, events and speaking with each one of them. But then, and so the main way is telling our story and connecting with people and, you know, everything from the Yale TEDx experience to yeah. have spoken at a bunch of, we've both spoken at a bunch of hospitals or medical conferences and yeah. just sharing our story and being open. And like I was saying to you a minute ago, not a day goes by that I don't get something from a survivor or a caregiver or a family member um, where we make those human connections in an incredibly intense and unique way. And then I, I think, you know, this is going to sound so cheesy, but every time we do something like this, where we speak with you or we speak with a, a fellow survivor or caregiver, I think it's life affirming in terms of remembering that it can all change like that. And I really think it's easy to forget that and just to, to remind you the importance of the present and of loving your loved ones and living your days purposefully. And like, we really do know as a result of what he went through, um, what it feels like to live like you're dying. And I think that changes, I think that forever changes your perspective and your outlook on life. And I'm sure you feel the same way, Absolutely. but you take that into your life in intimate ways mm -hmm. and to the extent that you can in more universal global ways to a broader good. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This was wonderful. You guys are amazing. Well, so are you. you. Oh, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for doing this.